Hello and welcome to our first ever town hall meeting on the innovative projects for animals supported by PETA's Global Compassion Fund. I'm Lisa Lange, PETA's Senior Vice President of Communications, and I'll be your host this evening. In a few minutes, I'll be joined by PETA President Ingrid Newkirk, PETA Asia Operations Manager Ashley Fruno, and Sylvie Bunz, Special Projects Manager for PETA Germany. And together, we'll tell you how PETA's Global Compassion Fund is helping animals from Jordan to the Philippines and many other places in the world. We'll be answering your questions live a little later. So to ask a question, just press zero on your phone. Or if you're joining us online, type it into the field at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to your question this evening, please know we will answer each and every one as quickly as possible afterwards. If you're just now joining our meeting, welcome. I'm Lisa Lange, and I'll be your host for today's town hall on the life-changing work of animals supported by PETA's Global Compassion Fund. If you find yourself inspired by the many powerful rescue stories from across the world we'll be sharing with you this evening, please consider pressing 7 on your phone to make a much-appreciated gift to the fund. Okay, it sounds like nearly all of our callers are on the line, so let's get right to it and introduce PETA President Ingrid Newkirk. Ingrid? Thanks, Lisa, and welcome everyone to our fifth member town hall this year. If you've been with us before, tonight's meeting will be a little different, because rather than focus on what PETA is accomplishing here in North America, we're going to offer a glimpse into the life-saving work of the animal groups in Asia, in Europe, and the Middle East that are all directly supported by PETA's Global Compassion Fund. The impact of PETA's work for animals does reach across the globe. As the CEO of any international corporation we've targeted will certainly attest. But even so, that reach has its limits. That's why we started PETA's Global Compassion Fund. Because when animals are in desperate need and we want to draw on cultural knowledge, the local knowledge of the people there, so that we can most effectively help them, PETA's Global Fund allows us to enhance the work of really top-notch local animal groups, ones we've checked out, like those you'll hear about tonight. And it also helps us quickly respond to emergencies. We don't have to start up from afresh. That means earthquakes in Mexico and Japan, the hurricane in Puerto Rico, and most recently that massive explosion in Beirut. And just hours after the news of that devastation in Beirut began flooding the Internet, we went into immediate response mode. We were obviously, like everybody else, extremely concerned, thinking of all those frightened and injured animals who were left in the wake of the blast. So we reached out to Animals Lebanon, and they were on the case right away, right from ground zero, as it were. And we were able to provide financial support to them to boost their work to reunite lost animals with their families. Peter's Global Fund also helped us send a rescuer there to Beirut from Peter UK. And she went to search the ruins in the city, just devastation, calling out for animals who might be hiding, frightened under some rubble, and needed food and water and rescue. And as soon as she arrived, she began delivering critically needed supplies of dog and cat food to families who'd lost their homes in this massive explosion. And she gave food to other volunteers who were working to ensure that displaced animals lost all over the city wouldn't go hungry. She was warned to stay away because there was civil unrest. You may have seen the riots on television. Um, but she didn't. She, she didn't listen. She, she soldiered on. She was a true Peter person. And she came across a dog that she will never, ever forget. He was a painfully thin, I suppose you'd call him a guard dog, chained up somewhere. He had white whiskers, old guy, and his ribs were showing, and she found him chained up in the sweltering heat without a drop of water. And then locals warned her again 
this time not to come because she's already there, they warned her that the man who had chained this dog there was a Hezbollah official. And she said, don't, con they told her, don't contact him. But she wasn't going to leave the dog there in that condition. And believe it or not, she charmed that fierce man out of that old dog and she rushed him to the veterinarian. Not the man, the dog. The dog's name is now Arrow. And he's not only been neutered and vaccinated, but our rescuer found him a wonderful home in the hills behind Beirut, beautiful hills. If you're watching online, you can see the look of joy on Arrow's face as he starts settling into his new, I suppose, carefree life. First time ever. So on another day, our rescuer was combing through the rubble, and she spotted uh, something moving. It was a shell-shocked young chicken moving very slowly and awkwardly. And um, she took him to the vet, too. It turned out that this little bird's hips were fractured during the explosion. And the vet treated him, and uh, his na her name, I should say, is now Lola, and Lola is on her way to a full recovery. She is part today of a flock of 30 rescued chickens living with a kind vegan couple on the outskirts of Beirut. She's adjusted to her new home. She's eating and drinking well. And uh, she's actually found a best friend. His name is Greg. He's a rooster, and he's taken Lola under his wing, so to speak. Uh, we have many other animal rescues that are made possible by Peter's Global Compassion Fund, and we'll tell them about tell you about some of them today. But first, I want to bring back Lisa for some quick reminders. Lisa. Thank you, Ingrid. You can give an immediate boost to all the vital work we're discussing tonight by pressing 7 on your phone and making a generous gift to Peter's Global Compassion Fund. And if you have any questions about the rescues Ingrid just mentioned or any part of PETA's life-saving work, just press zero on your phone and a PETA representative will jot down your question and put you back into the call until we answer it live a little later in tonight's meeting. Now back over to Ingrid for more on how we're helping donkeys and camels and other animals in a different corner of the Middle East. Thanks, Lisa. Yes. Well... The work that Peter's Global Compassion Fund is supporting today includes work in the ancient city of Petra, Jordan. And that, that work has its roots in a Peter Asia investigation from 2017. And what happened then was a Peter investigator went to Petra and documented the exploitation and the abuse of about 1,300 animals who are kept there and they're used in the tourist trade. There are little donkeys. Most of them are malnourished. Many of them are lame. And they're being forced to climb, or they were being forced to climb, up 900 crumbling stone steps to the very top where there's a monastery in Petra that the tourists want to see. And then the donkeys are forced back down again with tourists on their back, up and back with tourists on their back. There, there are also visibly exhausted horses, and we documented them pulling these heavy carriages on a grueling, because uh, it's all rock strewn around there. There's a six-mile path uh, that goes from one end to the other, and they carry tourists in these carts. They go back and forth five or more times a day, every single day, Usually, they're not getting water. Water is a scarce commodity there. And they're often not even parked, as it were, in the shade so that they can cool off from the this absolutely scorching desert sun when they're, not being, um, when they're not being used. We also found camels at Petra, and some suffered from fly-infested open wounds. And they could be seen and they could be heard crying out, um, as their mouths were forcibly bound shut by their handlers. And then there are the children. They have nothing to do in Petra, so their amusement is the animals. And they would smash rocks on the animals' heads or beat them with rip, whips or, or throw stones at them. And children have even thrown pregnant horses off a cliff. 
Um, they tied a dog to a donkey's tail so that she was dragged, panicking, biting and screaming through the dust. That's their form of amusement. And we saw um, donkeys and horses being cracked across the skull for being slow. They were jabbed with pointed sticks that left wounds, and they were smacked very, very hard with chains and whips. We filmed ropes encrusted with blood that had dug into the animals' necks. And between rides, we saw animals were tied up so tightly they couldn't even sit down. So back then in 2017, we went to local authorities with these findings, and they pledged that they would improve conditions for all working animals, and they would stop this wanton abuse. They would put the kids back in school. But it was a joke, because when a PETA eyewitness returned to Petra the next year, 2018, nothing had changed, nothing. So we couldn't walk away. We had to do something. Uh, neither the Bedouin, who... Uh, run the place, basically, nor the government um, were going to listen to any effort to stop the use of animals. Uh, and that's what ultimately needs to happen. The animals have to, be, have to disappear. So what we did is we sent veterinarians there, and we opened a makeshift clinic. And that all was because of Peter's Global Compassion Fund. Couldn't have done it without it. We created indoor spaces for exams and for treatment, we put up cubicles where inpatients who are wounded or, or ill can spend the night. And we made a yard where these donkey patients and horse patients, mostly donkeys, can so safely recover from their wounds. Today, we have an excellent equine surgeon, I'm so happy to say. He joined us from Egypt. His name is Dr. Hassan. He runs the clinic. And we have some young boys, some young men, who assist him, and we have to have a guard at night because the locals get drunk and they cause problems for the animals and thus we are guarding the place. All the treatment we give is free, so patients arrive with gastrointestinal obstructions from eating plastic while they're out scavenging for food. They, they come in suffering from burns, broken bones, saddle wounds, very, very common harness wounds, and dog bites, they're attacked by dogs there. Um, there's even blunt force trauma from the beatings they get. And even stab wounds and razor blade wounds, those are common too. So having our clinic, our free clinic, means animal owners who never, ever bothered to do anything for ill and injured animals are now starting to realize that they have to and they can seek medical help. And they do. So the clinic is seeing new patients every day as word spreads through the region. And I suppose at first some locals were skeptical. They didn't appreciate all that the clinic was doing, and they threatened to throw us out. And these are fierce people. <laughs> but with time and with, luckily, the intervention on our behalf from the Jordanian Princess Aliyah, that's no longer an issue, at least not this year. And so now it's not just animal owners who turn to the clinic for help. Other locals are now calling uh, when they come across an injured animal. They're giving us tips. Here's an animal who needs your help. And that is how the clinic came to care for one particular donkey. He'd been so severely be beaten on the face and beaten on the neck that one of his ears had to be surgically removed. Poor dear. Um, parasitic infestations, as you can imagine, are common, so are hobbling injuries. Donkeys and other animals are tied around the hocks, their ankles, to a stationary object, or they have both their front legs tied together, sometimes with wire, to prevent them from wandering away. And there are very painful consequences to this foolish act. The clinic um, treated one young donkey for hobbling wounds that were so deep that his tendons in his leg were permanently damaged. Uh, Dr. Hassan has saved him. Uh, he's still undergoing treatment, but the clinic has expert staff and, and he's comfortable. 
What can I say? Many donkeys and horses arrive with painful face wounds, and these are caused by halters that, if you've seen a halter, I mean, it should all be fabric. These are metal chains made into halters that go around the animal's faces. So the clinic went to great lengths to import, when we could, 150 fabric halters, and they were distributed. They flew out of Dr. Hassan's hands. But then what we discovered was that some owners then took them and replaced the fabric in the part of the halter that stretches across the animal's nose with a metal chain, which completely defeats the purpose. So now the clinic team has to require that these owners either remove those chains that eat into the animal's faces, or they return the cruelly modified halters. So you can see there are challenges. Um, our team also operates, this is very important, this little mobile clinic, which is really, um, it, it's just a Jeep wagon, a, a, just a rented Jeep wagon. We, we pay a high price for it because it's hard to get a vehicle. And that goes out to reach animals down in gorges that surround the site. This is hugely rocky terrain. And combined with the inpatients, I think our staff reaches, well, hundreds, hundreds of animals, like the severely injured donkey some of you are seeing on your screens now. If you can see him, th this poor fellow arrived at the clinic with this giant flap of skin dangling from his thigh. He was basically stripped of his skin. Only he knows how it was torn off. We do not but he was in terrible pain. And the injury had clearly gone untreated for a long, long time, so long, in fact, that his skin had died by the time he reached the clinic. And Dr. Hassan had to perform reconstructive surgery on him. He has a long road to recovery ahead, but he's already beginning to heal really well, and we're very proud. Pandemic lockdowns, military checkpoints, all these things make seeing patients a challenge, especially when the emergency calls come in after hours uh, during the curfew. And um, the curfew has been very strict there. But we get around it somehow. And remember, we have no x-ray machine, no anesthesia machine, no real ambulance. And it's very hard to get supplies because you can't import them anymore due to the pandemic. So we do have to pay top dollar for the things that we absolutely need to get these animals back in shape. We have only the basics, but by golly, we make it work. And the clinic team soldiers on, even when a nervous donkey kicks one of them in the head, which is what happened to one of our relief vets, Dr. Teveza. Um, Dr. Teveza was very brave, and she got stitched up. She has a, a huge headache, but she came right back to the clinic and went right back to work. So their determination, their resourcefulness, also recently helped a young camel, not even a month old, just a tiddly fellow who had an awful open leg fracture. They worked our staff very quickly and very carefully in the desert sand, not the ideal treatment area, uh, to clean the young camel's wound, and they set the brake. And that was tricky because they had to assemble a cast that was sturdy enough so that the leg could heal properly, but also removable so that they could continue to treat this wound that he had with the brake. And almost as soon as they put the cast on, they sent us pictures, he gingerly headed straight for his mother and started nursing. Well, thankfully there are no tourists riding the animals during this lockdown, and Jordan has been hard hit by the pandemic. But that comes with another side to it, because it means that many owners can't afford to feed their animals these days because there's no income for them. So what they do is turn their animals out to eat from garbage cans. And that means that many of them ingest plastic, 
which clogs their intestines. And if it's not removed, which is tricky, they can die very badly. So in addition to emergency medical care, what the clinic finds itself doing is having to provide fodder and to pay for water carriers to fill the drinking tanks so the animals can survive. Lastly, there is more work to be done on the clinic itself, our little place. Because, for example, when temperatures rose over the summer months, and it's very, very hot there now, modifications had to be made to provide sh more shade for the patients so that they could escape the burning sun. And after a horse died from what was either a snake bite at the clinic or um, it could have been uh, some other insect bite, poisonous insect, we don't know. could have been something. Uh, we didn't find it. Our staff turned over rock after rock in search of whatever this venomous intruder was. What happens now is they have to keep fires burning all night to ensure no other snake or whatever it was can come in and bite the animals. Um, there are also other pressing needs. We do need to purchase that x-ray machine, uh, the other equipment I mentioned, so that we can more properly diagnose and treat the less obvious medical issues. So hearing that, if you can, please become part of this operation. Press 7 on your phone right now, and you can help Peter's Global Compassion Fund keep clinics like those in Petra Wonderful, wonderful clinics working hard to help sick and injured animals that no one else, no one else will help them. So I'll now pass it over, while you're pressing seven, pass this back over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Ingrid. Right now, hundreds of donkeys and horses and other animals in Petra rely on the life-saving support provided by PETA, the Global Compassion Fund. And when the lockdown begins to loosen and the tourist trade resumes, their needs will become even more urgent. That's why I hope you will, as Ingrid said, press 7 on your phone to make a generous gift. If you're joining us online, you can visit PETA.org slash GCF and donate there as well. Now let's spin the globe and take a look at Romania, where the homeless animal crisis is one of the most severe in all of Europe. There are about 600,000 animals in Romania who don't have homes and live on the streets. They struggle to find enough to eat and find water to drink, and they often spend their lives dodging vehicles on city streets. The problems in Romania are huge, but PETA Germany and its Romanian partner group, Edux Anima, have crafted a multi-pronged approach to stopping suffering and stemming the tide of animal homelessness. Joining us now is Sylvie Boons, Senior Special Project Manager for PETA Germany, to give you the scoop on this important work supported by PETA's Global Compassion Fund. Over to you, Sylvie. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yes, it's like you said, Romania's animal crisis is, well, a big crisis. But we are tackling the big issues in every way we can. We've seen an increase in cruelty reports and animal abandonment during the pandemic. But no matter the circumstances, life can be grim for dogs and cats in Romania. Many areas of rural Romania are desperately poor. Even those dogs who have guardians are often treated like living alarm systems, kept on heavy chains in backyards without adequate shelter, watching sadly as life passes them by. Dogs and cats scrounge for food in every community. These animals are often struck by cars or attacked by other animals, and people have no money to pay a vet, so we are answering calls around the clock to prevent these animals from lingering in pain. Unfortunately, animals who are taken to Romania's shelter typically have little chance at survival or happiness. While there are some clean and efficient shelters run by kind people, there are far more facilities with uncaring stuff and truly awful conditions. It's common to see animals pulled from the streets and taken to killing stations that operate like slaughterhouses or even to severely crowded into shelters that are hell on earth. The animals in them live on floors covered with their own waste 
die slowly of diseases like parvovirus or somehow stay alive and wind up just as hungry, thirsty and scared as they would be on the streets, if not more so. Regulations go unenforced due to lack of interest by officials and a system of corruption that actually profits from the homelessness and killing of animals. So most animals are not cared for properly, not spayed and neutered. Male dogs who have guardians but are still left outdoors hoop fences and roam freely, impregnate female dogs, and then, of course, more puppies are born. So we are trying to stem the flood of unwanted newborn animals, no small feat. In the almost two years since Peter Germany and Eduk Sanima launched this project, we have sterilized and provided medical help to more than 14,000 animals. We have a team of seven people working for animals every day and, I have to say, every night, and a mobile sterilization and public education campaign traveling to some of the country's poorest areas to help. It's exhausting work, but I've been seeing firsthand the difference it's making. Let me please share a couple of stories of the individual animals we've reached, thanks to kind people like you. Last year, we met a charming dog who was named Pandora when our spay neuter campaign sterilized her and other dogs in a small village. But just a couple of months ago, we learned that her owner didn't want her anymore and she was going to be poisoned. It sounds terrible, and it is. But sadly, it's the way of life in Romania. So, we rushed to Pandora's village, brought her to our office, and gave her a chance to find a new home where she'll be loved and played with as she deserves. Romania's rural areas also have a cruel practice of burning dogs, usually puppies with hot metal, thinking that this will treat or prevent distemper. Our team learned that one young dog in Titeshti who had received this treatment was suffering from a bloody, festering discharge from her nose. All six of her siblings had died before we arrived, but we were able to provide her with veterinary care and give her a whole new leash of life. I'm sure you understand why it's so vital that we provide help in areas like these. Before the coronavirus pandemic, Peter Germany and Edox Animat traveled from home to home, village to village, with leaflets to announce our upcoming free services. People would go to the city centers with their companion animals and we would perform surgeries, give vaccinations, provide wet care and make sure that animals are registered, covered has made our working conditions very difficult so. We've been limited to working with open veterinary clinics and makeshift locations, but we won't stop. Yes, the pandemic has led to a greater abandonment of animals as their guardians face financial troubles too. So, while our work is harder than ever, it's also much more important that we provide low-cost care, deliver food to keep animals' bowls full, and do all we can to reach those in need. So, we are spreading kindness at every level. We work with majors and local law enforcement when we travel from town to town, and everywhere we go, we enter the schools, teaching the teachers, who then in turn teach the children to have empathy for all beings. I am thrilled to report that we have succeeded in making human education and treatment of animals a mandatory class in the regions where we operate. Even more importantly, the children take home what they learn and share it with their parents and grandparents influencing their whole families and helping us to bring truly sustainable change for animals. We face challenges to our education work because of COVID, of course, but we have been offering online resources and other fun activities for children to keep them learning about kindness. When lockdowns were at their strictest, we were able to convince the government to allow senior citizens to leave their home twice a day to walk their four-legged friends. 
You can imagine how uncomfortable that would be for any animal stuck at home, only able to relieve themselves once a day. Of course, many dogs are always outside, particularly the sad ones who spend their days chained up exposed to extreme summer heat and freezing winter winds. That's why we have started delivering study dog houses to these dogs, literally the difference between life and death for them. We replace heavy chains with lighter tie-outs so they can move more freely and try to convince their owners to bring them indoors to live more happily with the rest of the family. We need all the support we can get to build more dog houses and offer other resources. So if you can make a donation to PETA's Global Compassion Fund tonight by pressing 7 on your phone, I know our animal friends would be truly grateful. I wish I could share many more stories with you, but I'll close with this one. In June 2019, in Fladeshti, our team meet and treated a sweet and playful puppy who was suffering from a severe case of mange. Just weeks ago, we were back in Fladeshti with our spay-neuter campaign when a special patient turned up again. That same puppy was now back to be neutered. It's wonderful to be reunited with the animal friends we've made, but more importantly, it's a sign of how much we are changing guardians' hearts that they continue to come back and spread the word about our work. Our campaigns are very expensive, and we are so lucky to work alongside good-hearted, competent people. So to those of you who are donating to PETA's Global Compassion Fund and helping us change lives in Romania, thank you from the bottom of my heart, or to say it in Romanian, mulțumesc din suflet. Yes, a huge thank you to everyone who has supported this work in the past, to everyone who's pressing 7 or giving online tonight. And thank you so much, Sylvie, where it's 3 a.m. where you're speaking to us, uh, for the terrific impact your team and Edux Anima are making. One last reminder that Sylvie, Ingrid, and Ashley, who you'll meet in just a moment, will be answering all of your questions about the work we're discussing towards the end of tonight's meeting. To ask yours, just press zero on your phone at any time. Now let's bring back Ingrid to fill us in on how PETA's Global Fund is strengthening an organization you may be familiar with that's helping thousands of animals in India. Ingrid? Thank you. And I am just blown away with the pictures I see of Sylvie's work in Germany and Romania. If you're a regular attendee of our town halls, you've heard me talk about Animal Rahat, the organization I founded in Maharashtra, India, in 2003. And it provides relief to working horses and working bullets, lots of other animals. The scope of this work has grown tremendously in the last few years. And thanks to many who are listening tonight and who support Peter's Global Compassion Fund, I'll give you a few examples, and there are many of them, but today we'll talk about a few. Today, Animal Rahat operates four animal welfare units, and each has a well-stocked ambulance, a team of animal care experts, and a scout on a motorbike. The teams rescue and they provide medical care to animals of all kinds. The scouts go out and they look for animals in trouble, and they find them, dogs with their heads stuck in large jars, these are the jars that the roadside stands use to put sweets and things in. And when they're empty, they throw them out. Dogs get their heads stuck in them. They find animals who've fallen down deep wells. You've probably seen the pictures. They're all over the whole state of Maharashtra. And they find monkeys who have been electrocuted on live wires, which is another common Indian calamity. They rescue tiny baby birds whose nests have been destroyed and they work to release elephants held in chains, abused in temples, another local atrocity. Our teams conduct extensive community outreach, including a humane education program like the one Sylvie talked about in Romania, that teaches school children to empathize with animals, and then those children go on to do things like remove the nose ropes from their family's bull's noses that are so uncomfortable and awful, or get parrots out of cages in the market. Really lovely, lovely uh, children. And staff are reaching out to, to temple priests. 
They're convincing them to help us by telling villagers they're not going to get an extra blessing if they force already exhausted working bullocks to haul carts loaded with families and belongings hundreds of miles to the Chinchali Fair, which is this annual goddess festival in the region. People go there to be blessed. Every year, Animal Rahat improves the lives of more than 20,000 donkeys and bullocks and ponies and other working animals, each one a wonderful individual who needed our help. So our crews work 24-7, 365, even when they're faced with challenges like now the pummeling monsoon rains and the pandemic lockdown. So the staff have waded through floodwaters to retrieve stranded puppies and calves. And during last year's monsoon flooding, they rescued a donkey who was struggling to give birth as the water rose all around her. So only because of animal rahat, instead of drowning, both the mother and the baby survived. When India went into lockdown, Local authorities thankfully recognized that Animal Rahat's work was essential, and they gave them special permission to operate. And this has allowed the team to feed hundreds of starving animals, the ones who usually ordinarily de depend on handouts from shops or restaurants, passers-by, railroad passengers. Those are what they used to uh, depend on to survive, but all those things have been lost. Everything ground to a halt during the quarantine, and the, there are no scraps out for them. So Animal Rahat fills the gap. Animal Rahat also routinely rescues crows, pigeons, and a bird like a sort of e eagle called an Indian kite. These are birds who become entangled in netting or kite string, and uh, the team is often called to collect wildlife like civet cats, even snakes who found their way into homes or businesses, and they get them out and release them back into their natural environment. So Animal Rahat's team has a talent. It is especially trained in repelling so that they can expertly rescue animals trapped in those deep wells throughout rural India. They've hoisted up bullocks, kittens, dogs, and all manner of animals from these hideous man-made hazards, and that has spared them from drowning or simply starving to death. And our team treats injuries that they may have sustained during the fall before returning them to guardians or to their forest homes or to their villages. Those watching online should be seeing right now an image of a baby jackal that the team found precariously perched on this teeny ledge just above a, the water line in this 80 feet deep well. And what must have happened is he must have uh, tumbled over the edge, a terrifying experience, just falling and falling until he splashed into the dark water belong, below. And then he would just be waiting, wet, scared, alone, until... Our team came along and rescued him, and if they hadn't come along, for him and countless other animals, uh, you know what the, would have happened. So Animal Rahat really does spell the difference between life and death. Then there are other animals like Champy, whose story I love. Um, People magazine told his story as an exclusive, and you can watch a video of him on the front of Animal Rahat's website right now. Animal Rahat staff spotted this poor little dog, Champy, hopelessly stuck in the gutter. She was adhered to the pavement with fresh tar that covered her entire left side, all four of her legs, both ears just smashed down into the tar. She would never have been able to pull herself free on her own and would surely have died right where she was lying among the trash on the side of the road if they hadn't spotted her. Um, they sedated her, carefully freed her from the pavement, and immediately began what was a days and days long process of removing the remaining tar using vegetable oil, coconut oil, patiently, gently working this into her skin until all the tar was gone. 
So Animal Rahat vaccinated and spayed Champy. Everybody they touch is sterilized. And today she is thriving. She's in a new home. She's become fast friends with the chickens and the other animals who live in that household. And then there is the organization's groundbreaking mechanization programs, which you know about, I think, most of you. And Animal Rahat's Brick Kiln Mechanization Project has already rescued more than 200 donkeys from back-breaking labor. And they've retired more than 150 donkeys to our partner sanctuary in the Nilgiri Hills. This is a very beautiful, quiet place, far removed from the bustle of India's busy, busy cities. We're helping the sanctuary expand now. Um, into a new 28-acre space, and that will allow even more room for these former brick kiln donkeys and the other animal rahat rescues to thrive. It's a massive undertaking. It requires leopard-proofing the donkey's enclosures because the big cats try to take a donkey at night and we won't let them. And it involves putting up elephant-proof fencing around the perimeter so that the elephants don't barge through there in the day. And, of course, again, work's complicated by the arrival of the monsoon and the lockdown restrictions that shut down markets and borders and so on, which means it's extremely difficult to get necessary supplies on time. But we're making great progress, so despite all that, we're succeeding. Um, let me tell you about Rumba. Rumba is one of the donkeys who was formerly forced to work in a brick kiln and now lives in our Nilgiri Sister Sanctuary. And there with her is her daughter, Bawari, because Bawari was born just days before her mother, Ramba, was rescued. And if her mother hadn't been rescued, Bawari would have grown up enduring vicious whippings and beatings to keep her moving with hundreds of pounds of clay bricks piled on her back without breaks, without food, without water without rest. So now Ramba and Bawari are spending their days together. They're grazing on fresh green grass and they're lounging around under shady trees. And then there's Thomas. I have to tell you about him. He's a bullock who Animal Rahat retired from working in a sugar factory and he's at the sanctuary too. Before he was retired, Thomas suffered the bite of the whip sharp jabs from pointed sticks if he stumbled or dared to slow down between the, beneath the tons of, of sugar cane that rested on a yoke on his shoulders. He was one of 17,000 bullocks who have been retired from abuse at sugar cane factories because Animal Rahat helped the factories replace the bullocks with tractors. So Thomas is thriving in his new life, uh, where the only sugar cane he ever sees comes in the form of jaggery. Jaggery is this sweet treat that he gets to enjoy when we have sanctuary celebrations. Thomas also loves to be groomed. He gets groomed every day, and he really enjoys affection from his caretakers. He plays, he relaxes with his friends like Rauscher who is one of the first Bullocks Animal Rahat ever retired from the sugar industry. The sanctuary is also the new home of five more ponies who have been forced, uh, they had been forced to, to haul these two-wheeled carts called tongas through the noisy and congested and polluted city streets. These carts are heavy on their own, but when they're overloaded, well beyond the weight that a pony's back is meant to bear, there's trouble. So the rescued ponies, which are Roshane, Bulamama, Muskan, Salu, and Roshan, all worked for years under those conditions, but today that's all behind them, thanks to Animal Rahat. They run and they play. You can see them on the website. They're just trotting around with other sanctuary residents and rolling in the sand pit or, or rolling in the grass. We have a 10-acre sanctuary, and there the ponies joined a community of nearly 100 other rescued and retired residents. Those are bulls, horses, camels, buffaloes, dogs, sheep, 
and other ponies. Some were even rescued from um, circuses or they were found abandoned, or woefully neglected, as in the case of Mina. She's a beautiful cow. And what we found was her horns had curled and grown right around and back into her face. And her, her rumen, her stomach, had over 113 pounds of plastic inside it. So if we hadn't found her, there would be no Mina. Earlier this year, Animal Rahat acquired additional sanctuary space because we acquired 150 tiny chicks. We had rescued them from a farmer who was about to bury them alive because of coronavirus fears. They're, they have a sanctuary annex now. It has a large indoor area for them to eat and sleep and lots of outdoor space where they can scratch in the dirt. So today, thanks to the support of kind Animal Rahat donors and Peter's Global Compassion Fund, they're all growing up among tall grass and shady trees, and I think that's something every chicken deserves. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And you can keep up with the amazing rescue work of the Animal Rahat team by visiting their website at animalrahat.com. That's R-A-H-A-T.com. Signing up for their e-news and following their regular updates on Facebook and Instagram. It's all really inspiring stuff. Of course, none of that life-saving work would be possible without the generosity of donors to PETA's Global Compassion Fund. So please consider pressing 7 and making a gift before the end of tonight's meeting. Let's keep the work going. Now, if you're one of the millions who have seen footage from the Petra investigation or the disturbing video of captive monkeys forced to harvest coconuts in Thailand, you're already familiar with PETA Asia's landmark investigative work. But that's just one piece of what they're accomplishing for animals. To tell us more about PETA Asia and their critically important work for animals, Let's turn to Ashley Fruno, PETA Asia's Manager of Operations and founder of the Philippines-based rescue group, Pasai Pups, whose crucial work is boosted by PETA's Global Compassion Fund. Ashley, over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and hello, everyone. Lockdowns in the Philippines have left tensions running high, just like in many other countries. You may have heard that there have even been threats of imprisonment for those who don't wear masks here. And that's just scraping the surface of the many challenges we've been facing during this pandemic. Metro Manila, where our spay and neuter and rescue work is centered, was placed back under lockdown earlier this month, and our regular vehicle was banned from the roads once again. We persisted, just as we always do, but it was very tricky to reach animals in need when car travel itself is difficult or even impossible. Our staffers walked long distances to bring rescued animals to their foster homes or adopters, respond to reports of animals in distress and to deliver pounds upon pounds of food to poverty-stricken guardians who couldn't afford to feed their animals. This is all done while observing safety precautions, of course, and fortunately, restrictions were slightly eased again last week. We're processing a flood of adoption applications and responding to reports of animal emergencies around the clock every single day. We're today helping countless homeless animals who remain vulnerable to starvation, parasites, and injuries, even on empty streets. We delivered almost 6,000 pounds of animal food to humans living in deep poverty at Manila's Sargento Mariano Cemetery, and we've been given even more food, 2,000 plus pounds, in fact, of food to families who've lost income during the pandemic as well, so they can continue to feed their cats and dogs. We've also rushed out media advisories to debunk myths about the coronavirus and companion animals. PETA Asia is no stranger to logistical issues or even disastrous circumstances. What seems like a lifetime ago back in January when the coronavirus crisis was still quietly brewing, we were the first animal group responding to the devastating eruption of the Philippines to all volcano. Tal is an isolated island where most of the residents live in severe poverty. Before the volcano erupted, Global Compassion Fund donors helped us send a team of veterinarians to the island four times a year so we could tend to hundreds of overworked, undernourished, and utterly miserable horses who were forced to ferry tourists up and down the volcano every day. Our vets treated badly infected wounds and potentially deadly conditions like colic. They provided routine hook trims and parasite prevention, fed and vaccinated homeless dogs, 
and educated owners about compassionate animal care practices. Many of these horses were known only by their numbers. They didn't even have names. But of course, we recognized them as cherished individuals and offered them as much affection and care as we could. So as you can imagine, it was absolutely heartbreaking when we first landed on Taal immediately after the eruption, and we saw the rotting bodies of many of these horses alongside cows and other animals who had become buried under a thick layer of ash. But of course, we never gave up hope because there were still hungry and frightened animals cowering amongst the ash and debris taking refuge in ruined buildings and desperately waiting for our help. The chance of further eruptions meant that our rescue team literally risked our lives every single day to reach those survivors, but we weren't going to leave anyone behind. Despite the hazardous conditions and constant bureaucratic obstacles, PETA Asia made daily trips back and forth to the evacuation zone on Taal Island. We arrived in both packed with food and veterinary supplies, we administered emergency care and pulled surviving animals to safety. And when we prepared to leave for the day, we set out piles of food for those animals who were too scared by their, their ordeal and trauma to come near us. Every day, we left with boats full of rescued animals. One of those animals was my friend Pedro, whose leg was so hopelessly entangled in vines that he'd probably have died in the choking ash if we hadn't found him. We followed Pedro's cries to find him dehydrated, starving, and suffering from gangrene, but luckily we were able to carefully untangle his leg, carry him down the side of the mountain, and ferry him across the lake for veterinary care. Today, Pedro has a much safer and happier life indoors with a family who cherishes him. You might have already heard about another uplifting to all rescue story, a dog named Palakitik, who became somewhat of an internet sensation during the Ta'al chaos. Whenever we visited the volcano to treat horses, we'd call for her from the boat and she'd come scampering to greet the team and follow us absolutely everywhere. After the eruption, our rescue team feared the worst for Palakitik, not knowing if we'd find her dead or alive. But as soon as we set foot on the island, we called out for her all the same. You can imagine our amazement and sheer relief when Palakitik came bounding through the ash, overjoyed to see our friendly faces. I think I can safely say we were all holding back tears at that happy moment, and if you haven't seen it yet, you can view the video of her rescue on our website. But first, grab the tissues. The team gave Palakitik food, water, and lots of cuddles. Today, she has a soft bed to sleep in and the affection that every dog deserves. Pedro and Palakitik were among over 200 animals we ultimately rescued from Taal, and that's not just dogs and cats, but also horses, chickens, ducks, pigs, and even goats. We've now found wonderful adoptive homes for over 100 of these animals and returned many others to their families. And we're still going full steam ahead with our sterilization, vaccination, and education programs so that we can reach many other animals in impoverished areas of the Philippines. The impact of this work can't be overstated because staying and neutering, as you know, is the single most effective way to prevent countless unwanted animals from being born into tragedy and suffering. Our emergency work, our spay and neuter and vet clinic, and the many other vital campaigns supported by PETA's Global Compassion Fund, none of that comes cheap. PETA Asia has held fun events like Coffee for Cats and Pints for, Pints for Pops to raise awareness and funds for our work in the past. And in recent months especially, we've been overwhelmed by an outpouring of support, whether through monetary gifts or donations of necessities like hundreds of pounds of animal food but we do have more opportunities to help animals than we, do, than we have resources. So thank you to everyone who has made gifts to PETA Asia or PETA's Global Compassion Fund, and my personal thanks to each of you who pressed seven on your phone to donate during tonight's town hall. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Ashley, for all you and your team are doing for animals in the Philippines. If you haven't already, please do give as generously as you can before we end tonight's meeting by pressing 7 on your phone or visiting PETA.org slash GCF and help power all of the life-saving rescue work we've talked about this evening. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you to a few special people who are really coming through. There are more of you, but Joseph Roanoke, $500. Thank you. Bless your heart. Molly Riverdale, $250. Syed. Hi, Syed. I know you, $500. Um, Corrine in Oregon, $1,000. This, this is just wonderful. This all translates into absolute joy for animals. Katie in Taos, 
Taos, New Mexico, $500. Thank you, thank you, Elizabeth, in New York. $50 a month. That's a wonderful thing to give monthly. That gives us a real stability for our programs for the Global Compassion Fund. Kathy in Oregon, $500. Thank you so much. Nancy, Calgary, $1,000. Many, many thanks. Rachel and Peter in Houston, $700 in memory of Jenny Woods, who is a staff member we lost and who loved all these programs. She was with us for 31 years. So thank you all very, very much. This is tremendous, and thank you for everybody else who is still pressing seven. We've got this critically important work in the Global Compassion Fund. We've got to keep it strong and ready to respond to future challenges whenever and wherever they occur. And with that, Lisa, we've got to dash to some questions, please. Yes, yes, yes. We have time for about one or two, but we will answer all of them tonight. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, there is a live question, I think, from someone in Boulder. Yes, hello. This is Go Michelle. Ahead. Are there, thank you. Are there other places PETA is working to help donkeys other than in India and Jordan? Uh, I'll, I'll take that if you like. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, donkeys are so abused all over the world. There's no shortage. We've been working to try to stop, and we have closed down some places that are killing donkeys to use their skin in traditional Chinese medicine. The skin is boiled down after the donkeys are bludgeoned to death. This is all hideous to hear, but it goes on, and we have to stop it. So we've been working on that. We're also working on the Greek island of Santorini, and Sylvie, who has probably left us to go to sleep now, could tell you more about that because she's helping with it. But in Santorini, the donkeys are also made to go up lots and lots of stone steps with tourists on their backs who get off the ships below, and we are uh, absolutely ruining that trade with everything we can think of to do, leafleting on the ferry, taking out advertisements, getting stars involved, talking to the mayor, you name it. So I'm racing through this so we can get to another question. But yes, and all over India, from the ones who are picking up sand, they used to haul sand out of river banks. We got a lot of those released to us. So yeah, donkeys are definitely on our radar in many parts of the world. Thank you so much for asking that question, and thank you again to everybody for supporting rescuing donkeys. I'm going to take a quick question um, from the web, and that is uh, it's very timely. What is PETA doing to prepare for the impact of Hurricane Laura? So I'll, I'll go through this very quickly, but with all hurricanes, uh, especially those where with hurricanes, of course, we have notice. And so as soon as we know there's a hurricane or a storm brewing, we uh, contact local media. We do we run PSAs reminding people that not to abandon their animals and exactly what to do to make sure their animals are safe. Always take them with them, make sure their tags are up to date, never leave an animal chained or crated where they will drown. Then not only is it cruel, but it is illegal. So while one of our departments is doing that, our team who works on rescues in the United States gets in touch with all of those on the ground to find out exactly what is needed. Um, and the good news in the case of Laura, and again, I'm cutting through this very quickly, is that unlike with Hurricane Katrina, folks on the ground were very ready for this. And we understand from the rescuers there and the groups we're working with that animals are this time allowed in many of the shelters. So people are able to travel to the shelters with their animals, um, which is making for a much more safe situation than we've had in the past. We all remember the horrors of Katrina. That's all I have time to get into right now as far as that's concerned, but do know uh, we are on it as we are with uh, other natural disasters like that. And with, with that, Ingrid, I think I'll toss it back to you real quick. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm so sorry. We, we raced through trying to tell you as much as we possibly could about this fabulous Global Compassion Campaign. And again, thank you. Thank you for everybody who is a part of this, who props it up, keeps it going, and makes it allows it to expand. Uh, each thing we do represents an animal, and that animal is mighty grateful to all of you. Um, we go, if we didn't get to your questions, as we say, we will, so don't think you won't be answered. We promise uh, you will be. Before we sign off, one last request. If you'd like to stay on the line, you can leave a few words of thanks for Ashley, for Sylvie, 
all the others who are out there in the field uh, getting their hands dirty, getting grubby, risking their, their own health and safety, rescuing animals and changing lives, all because of the help of Peter's Global Compassion Fund, which means with your help. So thanks to each of you for your determination, your support, for every single thing you do to make the world a kinder place for all these beings we love so much. So thank you from me and good night. <laughs>